this new Jerusalem that's coming out of the heavens. So now John is up close and personal with this new Jerusalem. And we're going to see my drawing, uh, uh, my very um, uh, rough drawing of that here in a little bit. Now John's met this angel before. He was one of the seven bold judgment angels who poured out the wrath of God on earth during the latter part of the great tribulation. John's met this angel. He knows who he is. So here he is sitting on this mountain looking at this brand new Jerusalem. He's never seen it before coming out of the sky. Now if you notice in verse 9 of chapter 21 this angel called this new Jerusalem the bride, the wife of the lamb. And as we discussed last week, two suggestions on this. And I brought up Isaiah chapter 54, verses 5 and 6. And let, let me uh, remind us of that. Isaiah 54, verse 5 and 6 says this. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife, forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. So Israel is considered by God his wife. So it's interesting that when John sees this new Jerusalem coming out of the heavens, that he says it's like a wife. And Israel is recognized as the wife of God. And then Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, if you recall this, it says, in regard to the church, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So with Revelation 19, in conjunction with Ephesians and 2 Corinthians, we know that the church is recognized as the bride of Christ. So here we have, you know, this wife and this bride. And then John says it, that this new Jerusalem is, it, it, it's the wife and the bride. So, the description of the New Jerusalem from John's perspective is in reference to the Old Covenant saints and the New Covenant saints. That's who's going to be in this New Jerusalem. And I believe uh, the New Jerusalem will be inhabited by those people. I mean, that's just what's going to, those are the ones who are going to be in this New Jerusalem. So as the apostle stands on this high mountaintop, there were two things that he noticed right away other than the name that this is the wife and the bride. Number one, the city, he noticed, had the glory of God. Now, this doesn't necessarily speak of the brightness of God, but more so of the very presence of God. John recognized that this new Jerusalem is an area where God dwells. Number two, the apostle noticed right away that the city had, a, had the brilliance of a costly stone and it was crystal clear. So the, the city, it shined bright. And chances are the jasper that he mentions here is in verse 11 is actually a diamond. Many scholars believe that the jasper of John's day is quite different than the jasper of our day. You know, today jasper is commonly what red, maybe a little yellow at times, brown. It's unable to transmit light. But the jasper of John's day in the first century of the Greco-Roman world was like a diamond substance. And light would transmit through it. So what we have here is this. We have the Apostle John on a mountaintop. Normally John's in heaven looking down, but he was removed from there, placed on this mountaintop to get a closer view of this new Jerusalem coming down. And he noticed that it's very bright. He notices that it contains the very presence of God in a very unique way. Now, we know that God is omnipresent, right? And we discussed this also that if you were to take the new Webb telescope or the old Hubble telescope and look deep into space, that as far as that telescope can look, God is there as much as he is right here. 
But what's different about the new Jerusalem and now is that the, it's the unveiling of God's presence. Right now, God has to veil his presence because if his, his, if his presence were not veiled, it would wipe us all out. We couldn't handle it. But in the new Jerusalem, with our new resurrected, glorified bodies, God's presence will be unveiled. And the apostle John standing on this mountain is saying, out of all the existence, God has unveiled his presence in that new Jerusalem. So we will be in the midst of his unveiled glory. Now keep in mind that this city, this new Jerusalem, this bride, this wife, it's, it's not for someone else. It's for the Christian. It's for the saint of old. And that's where we're going to spend eternity together. Next, verses 12 through 21, John is going to give us this exterior look, exterior view of the new Jerusalem. Then later, he gives the interior view. So let's look at verses 12 through 21. The city's walls and construction. Let me read what it says here. And, and by the way, stop me anytime if we have any questions, okay? Because we're, we, we want to learn this we, instead of just having me talk all the time. That gets boring. Verse 12. It, the new Jerusalem, had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with a rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width, height are equal. And he measured its walls, 72 yards, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The, found, the first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the th and the fourth emerald. The fifth sardonyx, the, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth um, Crystal praise, as I said, the eleventh jacknith and the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Okay, so here is a very primitive drawing of your new home once we leave this world. Megan's going to bring that up in just a moment. And with this, I'd like to look at verses 12 through 14, which will give us the description uh, a little bit uh, of this here. Y yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't look all that great, does it? No. It'll be better than that. I I'm certain of it. <laughs> yeah, there's no color, I know, but I did write down the colors. Yeah, so you have to use your imagination. We're going to go through each one of these colors, too. So John saw this cube-like city. Here he is on the mountain. New Jerusalem's coming out of heaven with, with, within the new heavens. The earth, there's a new earth here. And John saw a cube-like city with massive walls. And each wall around the city had three gates for a total of 12. So that's why you see three gates there and three gates on the side all the way around. And the 12 gates bore the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. In addition... There's an angel standing at each one of the gates. So if you see up there, but Reuben, Dan, Judah, each gate has a name of one of the 12 tribes. There's an angel standing at each one of those gates. And the foundation of the city, it was made up of 12 stones, and on the stones were written the 12 names of the apostles. So that's why I kind of put, that's kind of how I see it, is this kind of stone strata all the way around. And there's 12 of those. 
And each one has a name. The name of each apostle. Now the big question is, is Paul's name on there? Probably not, no. Now, the mention of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles is theologically very important. First of all, notice that the two are separated. The tribes of Israel mark the gates and the apostles mark the foundation. This tells us that both will be part of this city. Now, we've already established that earlier because of the name, recognizing it as the wife and the bride. But we see it again here that God is including into this city the saints of the old covenant and the saints of the new covenant because he certainly wouldn't have the saints of the old covenant of the 12 tribes names on there if they were not included in this new Jerusalem. Secondly, it tells us that there is a distinction between Israel and the church. In other words, the church never replaces Israel. There is a theological concept or thought within Reformed theology or covenant theology that says that the church replaces Israel. But as we see here within this new Jerusalem, there's a distinction. And all throughout time, it's important all within our time, it's important that we understand that there's always a distinction between church and, the Israel, and Israel because there are Old Testament prophecies regarding Israel that have yet to be fulfilled. Those Old Testament prophecies will be completely fulfilled during the millennial reign. That's one of the main purposes of the millennial reign is to fulfill Old Testament prophecy concerning Israel. The church and its dispensation are distinct from those promises. So the church never replaces Israel. And as we see here within the New Jerusalem, God maintains that distinction for all eternity. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? So heaven will be made up of the saints of Israel, the New Jerusalem, of the Old Covenant, and the church of the New Covenant. One other theological, yes. I was just wondering. Yes. Are we all descendants of one <coughs> of the tribes of Israel? Are we all descendants of one of the tribes of Israel? Yeah. I mean, does our, does our family lineage go back to where uh, they Jim is from the tribe of Judah? And my family may be from the tribe of Reuben. Um, when we get to heaven, is that how we're going to be sorted out? <laughs> <laughs> so when we, when we get to heaven, how are we going to be sorted out? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so we, we all come from, we, we do have a common ancestor, Adam. So he is the beginning, Adam and Eve. That's all of our greats times many grandparents right but by the time you get to the 12 tribes there are many distinctive groups of people that did not come straight from those 12 tribes so that would mean that we are not associated with the 12 tribes in in general now now somewhere in our lineage we may have Jewish lineage that is connected to one of the 12 tribes. Because if you're Jewish, you're connected to one of the 12, right? Because Abraham was the father of the Jews. So Abraham and Sarah, any of those kids, or even from the other end, from uh, Ishmael. You know, if you're from Ishmael, then you're not connected to the 12, but you'll be connected to Abraham. But if you're Jewish, you're likely you're connected to one of the 12. But there's a lot, I mean, the world is populated at this point. So we could be from one of those groups and not um, the 12 tribes. But I, I think I know what your thinking is here, yeah. <laughs> good thinking, good thinking. Yeah, it'd be kind of neat if, if that was the case, yeah. But definitely from Adam, yeah, most definitely. Right. 
Right. Yeah, you know, and Paul tells us that Christians are actually heirs of Abraham. So, and from a spiritual standpoint, we are, yeah. One other theological importance is that the 12 apostles are the foundation of this city, which I find interesting. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, listen to this. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. You know, the apostles, the apostles represent the church. Those who are built on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus. That, that's what that is. So it's very fitting that the new Jerusalem, that the foundation would be recognized as the apostles. That each strata there of color would be one of the apostles. Very interesting. So this is the new Jerusalem. Not only does it have the 12 tribes representing the saints of the old covenant, but it also has the 12 apostles representing the church. Both are part of the holy city. And this is where we're going to be living. Let me develop, let's develop this a little bit more. Verses 15 through 21 develop this. We've already read them. So let's look at the construction of this city here. The angel who spoke with John and placed him on this high mountain, he measured the city with the same measurements that humans would use, which is interesting, isn't it? It came out to be approximately 1,500 miles on each side and 1,500 miles tall. That makes it a cube. So it's not necessarily just a square, it's a cube. It's a perfect cube. If the city sat on the east coast of America, it would stretch from Florida to Maine. So that gives you an idea on one side. And the square footage of the city is approximately the same as the moon. So when you look at the moon, square it off, and that's how big this uh, new Jerusalem will be. Dr. Charles Ryrie, former professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, said that, it has been calculated that even if only 25% of this space were used for dwellings, 20 billion people could accommodate it spaciously. If 25%, 20 billion could fill it spaciously. Let's hope that there's more than 20 billion occupying this new Jerusalem. The city walls are about 216 feet thick. But yet, they're made out of jasper. And the jasper of John's day is that clear crystal. Inside the city, uh, the inside of the city is made of pure gold, but it's clear as glass. And the foundation stones, where the names of the apostles are marked, each have their own color. And if you can bring that illustration back up, Megan, please. Each one has a name, each one has a color. Jasper, probably that clear diamond look. Sapphire was blue. Emerald, bright green. Sardonyx, red and, and white. Sardius or, uh, is um, red, chrysolite, gold, golden color. Burl, sea green, topaz, transparent yellow or green. Chrysoprase is green. Jacknith is, vi is violet. And amethyst is purple. So these are the stones, or these stones, they provide a brilliant array of color. Imagine, coming out of this, we're going to see in a little bit, is this bright light that's shining out from the, the midst of this new Jerusalem out. And all the walls, they have this transparency. So you have this, all this color, and not just color within the new Jerusalem, but color throughout all of the heavens, the new heavens, and all throughout the earth, it's just color. The rainbow today gives us a picture. So imagine that rainbow where the light can shine through it and it's shining all that color. That's what the new Jerusalem is going to be like, full of color. It's like a prism. Yes. That's why, you know, the, the rainbow is very important to the Christian because not only is it a reminder of Noah's flood, that God would never flood the earth again, but it also gives us all these flavors of color that remind us of the new Jerusalem. And no one in all of existence is allowed to steal that 
It belongs to the born again Christian. These stones provide a brilliant array of color. The 12 gates are made of pearls and the city streets are pure gold. Remember that this is the Apostle John's best way to express from his vocabulary what this new Jerusalem looks like. Still a human. He, the only language he knew was his Hebrew and probably the Koine Greek and, and um, Aramaic. They were very smart back then. So this is going to be one magnificent city and to think that Jesus, the carpenter, is building it right now. Because remember in John, he said, Jesus said, where I go, I prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back to you, for you. And that place, is he builds it off of the Father's house. This is the new Jerusalem he's building. Any questions? Yes. Um, when the temple's been built, the, the dimensions and everything in the Bible are just so detailed. They're, they're perfect. I mean, but they go into so much detail. This would be no different. I would imagine this to be no different. And, you know, with the, and I think that's great that the measurement, the tool for measurement is the same <laughs> as what was here, used here. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, Deborah was saying that the, the measurements used, the, the strict measurements used to build the temple, God is doing that with the New Jerusalem. I mean, just, I mean, it just kind of fits right along with God. I want it this way, and I want uh, this particular measurement here, and this particular measurement here, and this height here. And he does that in the New Jerusalem. It's a very particular way. He has it nailed down, and then he gave us those measurements, and those measurements are human measurements as, as well. Yeah, that's neat. Yes? Right. So we don't, we don't need to sleep, right? Right. Exactly. We will, uh, we'll be awake. And remember, if you omit time, it's always present. So, yeah, this body doesn't need to be re rejuvenized, right? Need more sleep, more melatonin, more of this. You know, how do I get more sleep, right? Yeah, we won't have to worry about any of that. <laughs> Let's look at verses 22 through 27. The brilliance of the holy city. There's more description. Verse 22. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of of the, uh, of the glory of God has illuminated it and its lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. <laughs> Just to answer your question there. Its gates will never be closed and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the apostle, he, he was looking at the exterior, and he goes and he looks on the inside. You know, he's, he's got a view on the inside, staying on this mountain. As he looks on his side, he says, wait a minute, there's no temple. I, mean, I grew up looking at a temple. There was always a temple until 70 AD when it was destroyed, but there was always a temple. Even prior to that, there was a temple. Where's the temple at? He says, wait a second here. The Father and the Son. They are the temple. The whole city will be in the very presence of God all the time. They are the temple. And that's where, you know, you think of the Old Covenant. That's where God dwelled was in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies in the temple. He says, this whole new, Jer this new Jerusalem, there's no temple in it where God specifically dwells. He dwells in the totality, the whole of this new Jerusalem, where his presence is unveiled. And then verse 23, the city will not depend on light from the sun or the moon because it gets its lights from another source. The Father's glory and from the Lamb. Jesus they will shine bright and even even if the sun and the moon did shine for some reason or the sun 
shine in, in, off of the moon, they would be shadows compared to the light that are going to come from the Father and the Son within this new Jerusalem. So if you want to know if there's going to be a sun, there won't be. There will be the sun, but not the star sun. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I, I look at it as, you know, everything, and you've probably heard me say this before, and I want to bring it up again, because I think, it's, I think it's important here, that God, you know, a creator creates based off of what that creator knows. Everything that we have in existence isn't something that was just arbitrarily thrown out there. God, God had a specific purpose for all of it. We have a sun in our solar system for a specific purpose. We have a moon that was designed by God with this white dust in order to reflect the light rays onto the earth. All this is very specific. God built, created based, of, based on what he knows and what he has. So I think of a lot of what we have today gives us a glimpse, a picture of our future. When you look at the moon at night and the moon big and bright doesn't have a light of itself but the sun is shining on it and then you think of the new jerusalem and the new jerusalem is about the about the square footage square yardage of the moon but the new jerusalem doesn't shine bright in and of itself nobody goes in and flicks on the lights it's the father and the son who shine the light and it reflects off of the walls and off the color of the new jerusalem so when you look at the moon, or when I look at the moon, I, I think of the new Jerusalem. And I think that its light source comes from something else. In our case, it comes from our S-U-N. But the new Jerusalem comes from the S-O-N. Now, take a look at verse 24, please. 24 is a, a really tough one. It can be a very confusing verse. Let me just read it, just to get it back into our minds. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now, wait a minute. I thought, I thought heaven and earth was wiped away. We have a brand new heaven, brand new earth, and we have a new Jerusalem. Who are the kings? Who are the nations? Right? I mean, it's confusing. It, it almost seems like a verse out of place. <laughs> well, when we look a little closer here, and we look at that word nations, in the ancient Greek, that word nations is the word ethne. It's where we go to our word ethnic from. Ethne means anything that is non-Jewish, really. It's speaking of Gentiles. What this part of the verse is saying at the very beginning is that the Christian Gentile will take residence in this new Jerusalem. All the nations of the, of the Gentiles, all the ethne, all the Christians throughout this country, or country, throughout this world, who are the, the people who are the Gentiles, who are Christians throughout this world, will inherit this new Jerusalem. You will have the Jews, the saints, in this new Jerusalem, and you will have the nations of the Christians in this new Jerusalem. So we, we believe that's what that's saying there. The second part of this verse, which says, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, this likely means that those who were kings on earth, those who had some high leadership position, those who had the glory and the majesty on earth, they will attribute their glory and the honor that they received, and they will attribute it to the Lord and the God of this holy city. That's what many scholars, theologians believe that this verse means. Though I do understand that it is a difficult verse. So ethne, not only the Jews, but the Gentile Christians throughout the world will be in this uh, New Jerusalem. And those on earth who get glory now because of their position will then attribute that to the Lord during the New Jerusalem they will not have the glory and the honor, but they will give it to God. Okay. All right. So, finally, God will receive what is rightfully his. He will receive praise, honor, and glory from all his people forever and ever. 
Now verse 27 reminds us that there will, be, there, there will no longer be any sin in this city. We will be free from sin. We'll never be able to ruin this. None of us can ruin this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's done away. Sin has been eradicated. Adam and Eve had the free will. But once we come to Christ and then exit this body and get our new glorified body, there is no free will to sin because there's no ability to sin. It's not even, there's not even an opportunity to sin. The decision has been made. And we get to be in the glory of, this, of God within this new Jerusalem, never having to worry about ruining what God had created. Also, this verse is a reminder that not only the names, or excuse me, that only the names written in the Lamb's Book of Life will have the privilege of residing in this new Jerusalem. And of course, we know that our name is written when we have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's how we know our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So, any questions up to this point? Jennifer? Yes. Yes. Right, yes. Yeah, all the power that the kings and the presidents and that have today, it all will be attributed to God at that point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 good point, good point. Yes? Yeah, good question. Outside the city, we know that there's a new earth. But we, there's not a great description other than there's no sea. And it appears that we're not going to be locked into this new Jerusalem, but we are going to have the freedom to move about. So what God has planned in the future, we don't know. He hasn't given us that information. All we have is this new Jerusalem, and in it is the unveiled presence and glory of God. But, yeah. Yeah, the, the gates, what, what, what verse are you looking at? What? Yeah. Yeah, so in the, right, the New Jerusalem, there, the gates won't be closed. Yeah, exactly, thank you. So you, well, God doesn't lock us in. There's gonna be, well, I mean, really, I mean, it, so there must be something else, but we don't know. Scripture doesn't give us any indication about what's going to take place after he puts us into this new Jerusalem. I don't know what God has planned. He's, yeah, we don't need to know. Yeah, he got something planned. So we're not, we're not going to be up there playing on harps. You know, it, you know the, the whole boringness of what cartoons show when you go to heaven, you're playing on harps and you're just sitting around on a cloud or the three stooges when Mo wouldn't let Shemp in because... You know, Shemp was a bad guy, and so, so the, you know, they had to come back and to earth and deal with some issues. No, none of that's going to be like that. This, we're going to be in this unveiled glory presence of God, and there's going to be so much more. God hasn't even given us a hint of what that's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon just doesn't want to be in the kitchen. Yeah. You know what? Next week... There's gonna, there won't, we won't need a kitchen because you'll be able to pick from a tree. Yeah. Now, well, there may be a cleanup crew. But we'll, 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 we'll talk to God about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so the, city, the city won't be on earth. Okay. Good question. City won't be on earth. This is debatable. There's many who think, there's many theologians who believe that the new Jerusalem comes out of heaven and sits on the earth. I don't think it does. I think it's a satellite. And the reason I think it's a satellite, because our moon is a satellite, and I think that's a real clear picture of the new Jerusalem. And in scripture, it just says it comes down out of heaven, but it never tells us that it lands on earth. So I think it's distinct from the earth, and it's a satellite of the earth. 
but we can get, yeah, we can move in and out freely, exactly, and we won't be bound to gravity. Yeah, or heights. If any, if any of you guys have a problem with heights, don't worry about it. Yes. I think I've misunderstood something you said about ethne. Yes. Ethne, non-Jews. Okay, so it's Christian Gentiles. But what, what about the uh, converted Jews? Yeah, they, well, they're, they're established, okay. we, we believe, because of the different names. But it appears that in verse 24, the nations will walk by its light, that this is something that the Apostle John is being told that many Christians or many people throughout the world who have come to Christ are going to be occupying this. Where, you know, he's telling a Jew this. That there, this isn't just a Jewish thing. This is a Jesus, whoever comes to Christ thing. So that, that's, what, that's what the belief is. But believe me, I understand the difficulty here. And I don't know that any of us will fully grasp what this verse is saying. But it appears that that's what it's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Good question. All right. Yes, Larry. Yes. Yeah. We're going to have a lot to do. And, and think of the untold things of God. Like we don't even know what God has planned. I, I mean, we just have no idea. Like we, can, we can't even grasp what it's with this. I mean, God gives us a description of this new Jerusalem and we can't really even grasp it other than my primitive drawing. And that didn't help any. But imagine how grand this is going to be and then what he has, thanks Megan, and then what he has planned later in the future for us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it's going to be a, a, a lot of learning, a lot of, well, it's going to be an eternity of learning because God is infinite, boundless, limitless. So it's an infinite grace, boundless love, you know, uh, um, limitless joy. I mean, we're, we're going to get to know who God is throughout eternity. That right there, there's going to be a lot of uh, excitement in that. But then all this other stuff, I mean, who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yes. No. Yeah. We have no idea what the new earth will be used for. Uh, it, we just know that there's no water on it. And we're going to find out next week that there's water in Jerusalem coming from the throne. But nothing about that on earth and what it's going to be used for. So we'll, we'll probably occupy that. Uh, it seems like God's reverting back to the original creation where he designed the earth. Right. He designed the earth for his, his people but gave us the ability to uh, free will. To, you know, and, and we sinned and destroyed it. Where in this new earth, this new Jerusalem, like the new Jerusalem is like the garden type of thing. And then you have this earth that we can walk around on. Uh, he's reverting back to wanting to give his creation something from his heart, something of great joy to him. So whatever it is and whatever we're going to do, we're going to enjoy it. And it's going to be grand. Yeah, yeah, good question. But yeah, we don't know. We don't know. All right, well, let me close in prayer. It is 7 o'clock. We can be done. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the glimpse into the future for those who belong to you through your son Jesus and the Old Testament saints who looked toward the coming of the Messiah. Thank you, God, for giving us this glimpse. It's, it's exciting, especially now, Lord, uh, in, in the midst of the turmoil of our country and the world and China and Taiwan and Ukraine and just uh, North Korea and the difficulties we're facing here in our own country, just, there, there's a lot of craziness and with our bodies and with conflict. Lord, what you have planned helps us today to keep moving, to keep pressing on, 
to keep developing in our relationship with you, to keep developing in our relationship with one another and giving us, and it provides us the excitement to tell others about Jesus that they may have what you have told us we are going to have. So because of this, Lord, because of the book of Revelation and, and so much of what you provide in, um, in, this, in this information of, of the future, it, it keeps us upbeat. It keeps us motivated. So Lord, please, continue to expand on what you have provided here. Help us to see more in depth what our future home is going to be like. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful evening. Stay dry. I think it's raining out there.